This week's episode is brought to you by Ovaltine. Be sure to drink your Ovaltine. Ovaltine? A crummy commercial? Son of a... Hello and welcome to Can You Quickly, <laughs> the greatest online stumble. I mean, show. Well, that must mean I'm George and I'm Jeff, and clearly neither of us can speak correctly. Well, we can speak correctly. We're just not what you think too. We we know good speak. <laughs> we know good speak. <laughs> we also Probably. know go back to change. No good speak. Yes, obviously you're getting ready for your move to California then. Clearly, my my head is not in the game, even though it should be since it's on a related topic. So what was, that? What was that? All the clouds are gray, and the sky is. Never mind. Wait, I think you're singing that song wrong. Well, isn't it like all smoggy out there? It is a little smoggy outside. Okay, well, I mean, not in New Jersey. No, well, not in Jersey. Jersey, we have other problems, but like the snow. snow. Yeah, yeah, but I I don't care. I'm leaving the snow behind. So what happens if you do have to get up and you have to shovel the driveway in California? Um, then we're clearly not living in California, or the poles have shifted, and we have much bigger problems to worry about. Or you're about. in, like, like Northern California. Yeah, but we're not living in Northern California. Who, who is in Northern California? Like, Keith Gluck? Oh, oh Forget, yeah. Yeah. Forget <laughs> yeah. I was about to say Sasquatch, but yeah, I guess you hit the nail on the head there. Eh, Sasquatch, Keith Gluck, tomato, tomato. It's all the same. Tomato, it's tomato. We're going to be taking the, the, the Bluth Stairmobile out there. <laughs> nice. And Very I'll be working nice. at the banana stand. That's the job I took. There's always money in the banana stand. There's always stand. money in the banana stands. Always. The banana stand. I've made a huge mistake. It's time for Disney History. Disneyland has always been referred to as the world's first theme park, and no one's denying that Walt Disney didn't perfect the idea and execution of the theme park, but there was a small little park in Indiana that can rightfully claim the title of the first theme park. Or can it? Ooh, we start the segment off with a question. <laughs> question mark? Ooh, so nice. Uh, for the most part, amusement parks evolve from local fairs and pleasure fairs in Europe. Bartholomew Fair, Fair in London was a, a royal chartered fair that started in 1133. That was a long time ago. Yeah, what is that, like 20 years ago? Yeah, who knows more than that. Uh, the charter fairs existed to give each small town a three to four day celebration to honor their patron saint or their church. Tradesmen would travel to sell their wares, and eventually the fairs would involve musicians, wild animals, acrobats and puppets you know before when you said bartholomew fair i was almost like wow that was really pretentious of him to name it after himself but then i realized <laughs> that wasn't a name that was no, the name was, of the fair itself it was the name of the fair itself so. <laughs> <laughs> like disneyland like, like disneyland like disneyland but that's not pretentious at all no no not at all so the first amusement park is believed to be in Bakken. in as i said that wrong back in yeah, back in, in denmark Okay, and that started around 1583. Um, it's actually still one of Denmark's two most popular tourist attractions after uh, T Tuvila Gardens. Tivoli. Tivoli. I'm yeah. clearly the language thing tonight. Not working so well for us. So, <laughs> back in also known as the Hill, was also founded when a local spring was discovered there, and the springs were considered to have curative properties and were so popular that entertainers and hawkers followed the crowds there. Like they follow us. Yes, exactly. Everywhere. So, the the now the first World's Fair was held in 1851 in the Crystal Palace in Hyde Park in London, and it was based on the French industrial fairs that started in 1798, and showcased agriculture and technology. The Centennial Exposition held in 1876 was the first one held in the United States, and of course the 1939 to 1940 New York World's Fair would have significant effect on Disney, not just with technology, but also with planning Disneyland. And there's no direct confirmation that Walt visited the 39 
40 New York World's Fair, but historian and animation expert Michael Barrier has stated that Walt was in New York on April 2, 1940, but the fair was closed at the time. So could Walt have visited the fairgrounds and taken a tour? Uh, he also v visited Greenfield Village on his return trip, and the Ford Park has always had an influence on his thinking. Uh, the unofficial 1964-65 New York's World's Fair was definitely a big influence on Epcot Center. Uh, interestingly, both New York World's Fairs were the only ones to last more than six months. Each one ran for two seasons as opposed to just one. Now, in America, in the late 1800s, uh, we began to see trolley parks, which were picnic-like areas that were actually the end of the streetcar line and often paid for by the trolley, uh, the trolley company. Um, now, they were ways of getting the local citizenry to become reliant and use the trolleys on the weekends. Um, you would find the picnic areas and pavilions and swimming areas and ferris wheels and also some roller coasters. Um, but by 1919, there was an estimated 2,000 trolley parks in the U.S. And in the early 20th century, we began seeing the more traditional parks like Atlantic City, Coney Island, and even Kennywood. So the world's first themed attraction is considered Santa's Candy Castle that was opened in 1935 in Santa Claus, Indiana. And in 1946, Santa Claus Land opened, and it's in an epic, epic battle with Knott's Berry Farm for title of the first theme park. Knott's Berry Farm claims to be the first actual theme park opening in 1940 when Walter Knott added a ghost town to the waiting area of the restaurant. Uh, in addition to shops and attractions, uh, for selling their pies, obviously. And of course, and, we and all chicken know, dinners. In chicken dinners. Uh, we all know that Disneyland opened in July of 1955, and um, the term theme park came from one of the PR people that worked at Disneyland. So it's sort of like a debate. Was it Santa Claus Land? Was it Knott's Berry Farm? Or should we just go ahead and say Disneyland because Disneyland is just awesome? I mean, it's it's a very good debate. Um, I'm gonna have to. I'll, I'm gonna side on the on the Knott's Berry Farm side just because he he did it as a way to. It wasn't just a waiting area. It was to give his guests something else to do while waiting to sit down and eat in the restaurant. Um, mm -hmm. and it was a, a, a themed park. Uh, it had a an overlying theme of of the ghost town, and it's still there today. So I'm I'm gonna have to give it to that one. Okay, and Santa uh, Santa Claus land <laughs> which opened uh, a little bit later in time it's it, it sort of given the nod as saying this is the first theme park because the whole park itself was based on the theme of santa claus or santa claus land so you know i, I think we need to make some research trips actually I, I think we should go to both of them to figure this one out but i you know i love delving into the history of the theme park it's a little bit different for us yeah it's good to look at where it started and where it ended up but hey the history of the history of theme parks. Ooh, there I like go. it. That's a book like title. It. We're going to write it. Okay, let me write that down. All right. He's a nerd. He's a, nerd. He's a, geek. He's a geek. But we all like to hear him speak. So listen up to the words from his speech. Ah! It's George's Book of the Week. The Disney villain, uh, the book, not just the Disney villain, is a beautiful work by Ollie Johnston and Frank Thomas, two of Walt's nine old men. And I'm, I'm not sure if there are ever two people more suited to describing the Disney villain, well, besides me and Jeff. Um, Frank and Ollie were supervising animators at Disney for almost 50 years. And so more than meets the eye, this book does more than just look at the Disney villains. It also sheds light on what makes a villain and why some Disney villains were much better than others. So they look at 59 villains, only eight of which were actually female, over the course of almost 70 years. Uh, in the beginning, they talk about the Alice Shorts and how Peg Leg Pete was the first villain, although Ollie and Frank refer to him as more uh, as a bully. Pete made the transition from Alice to Oswald to Mickey, and ultimately, he was in 32 shorts with Mickey and friends, but he never achieved a starring role. Uh, throughout the rest of the book, they look at each animated film and discuss the villains. Not just which ones were truly scary, like the Evil Queen, but which ones added to the hero's quest and ultimately made the hero a much more beloved character. And it's difficult to sum up a work of this caliber. Uh, Ollie and Frank are not only terrific animators, but they tell a great story. 
and each villain is the center of a debate that is bookmarked between the evil queen and Jafar. Uh, the authors do more than just talk about villains. They also talk about the highs and lows of Disney animation. So this book really could be used as a starting point for anyone looking for an introduction to the Disney animated library. Some of the villains are villainous simply because of their nature. The Rat and Lady and the Tramp, the Bear and Fox and the Hound, and Monstro from Pinocchio. Not that they're true villains, but because of their nature is to forage for food, protect their environs, or because they are monstrous in size, they act as villains to the hero. Uh, other villains never quite made it. Ollie and Frank point to Radigan from The Great Mouse Detective, uh, Mr. McLeach from The Rescuers Down Under, and Prince John from Robin Hood. For various reasons, they felt that these characters, along with a few others, never quite made the bold statements that were needed, and in some cases, the hero was so powerful that it negated the villain's actions entirely. So beautiful artwork flows throughout this 232-page book. There are full-page shots, thumbnail sketches, storyboards, and rough sketches. And we see through the animator's eyes how a character is developed and comes to life on the page. Uh, both Captain Hook and Gaston were originally seen as foppish characters that were larger than life. And in both cases, the animators were instructed to bring the villain down to scale and inject more human characteristics into them. Uh, mainly so we would see them either with flaws or as people we have known, more like a villain archetype. So the bottom line, this is a wonderful book for any collection. It, it does center specifically on animation, but through the course of discussing the villains, a lot of history of the films and the Disney company rises to the top. Frank and Ollie have a wonderful narrative that is interspersed with anecdotes and knowledgeable insights into the world of the animated villain. And the amazing artwork alone makes it worth picking up this title. And, you know, the text is sort of the icing on the cake. And this book is called The Disney Villain, by Ollie Johnston and Frank Thomas. Now, did they talk about why the Disney villains were hiding New Fantasyland from us the entire time? No, because this sort of came after. But I'm assuming because but they But it's were, always been there. It's always been there. That's true. They it's need a, they there. need a second edition, I think. Because wasn't there some kind of dragon flying over protecting it? I don't I don't know what you're talking about. No? No. Oh, that's right. I'm not supposed to pour salt in that wound. We're done with this segment, guys. If it's a legend that you seek, come on and take a peek at the window of the week. Operating in many lands around the world, the Cast Doctor, celebrating our 50th, every cast a perfect fit, Greg A. Emmer, specializing in casting since 68. So Greg Emmer was a Disney cast member for almost 40 years. He started in attractions in 1968 on the Matterhorn and then moved to Florida to be part of Walt Disney World's opening team. He came back to Disneyland in 2003 and oversaw preparations for the 50th anniversary celebration in 2005. He retired in 2008 as a senior vice president of Disneyland Resort Operations. Sometimes you might see it, sometimes you don't. Hey, look, what's that? It's a five-legged goat. Over at Pop Century at Walt Disney World, each of the areas is themed to a specific decade. Now, one of the de uh, decorations for the 70s buildings is a four-story tall big wheel. Uh, this was built at 1 and 12.5 scale. So, if you look on the back side of the big wheel, you'll see that they even scaled up the recommended weight of the child who rides it at 877 pounds. That is one big kid, guys. Yeah. I'm just thinking, how big would my green machine have been? Ooh. Huh. Because I had a big wheel, but it was nothing like my green machine. Green machines are, uh, green. Exactly. And <laughs> machines. <laughs> yes. Obviously, but Jeff never had one. I was looking for something. I thought maybe I can Google it, or maybe I couldn't do it in time. What was a green machine? Well, the green machine was uh, sort of like a go-kart, except it had pedals and it had these uh, handles that you used to turn the back wheels. So it was like a was, manual. Yeah, there was a left and right lever. And you know, if you pull the left lever back, it turned the back wheels left so you would turn. I think I've seen one of those before. That's awesome. that's what um Fred Flintstone used to drive, right? <laughs> so anyways, uh, thanks so much for watching and listening to Communicore Weekly, the greatest online show. Yeah, be sure to leave us a comment and rate us on iTunes and let let us let us know if you know what a green machine was, because I didn't know. 
Yeah, you can email us pictures of your green machine at communicorweekly at gmail.com. You, yeah. you can also like us on Facebook at facebook.com slash communicorweekly. Maybe post a picture there. Yeah, we can discuss the green machine in epic detail. Well, anyways, so follow us on Twitter. I'm at Imagine Nerding, and he's at Jeff Heimbuck. And for Jeff Heimbuck, I'm George Taylor. And for George Taylor, I'm Jeff Heimbuck. Thanks so much for listening. We'll see you next time on Communicore Weekly, the greatest online show. L sees you.